Section 9 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 9, Collapse of the System. Mr. Lincoln had made thus far very little money, nothing more, in fact, than a subsistence of the most modest character. But he had made some warm friends, and this meant much among the early Illinoisans. He had become intimately acquainted at Vandalia with William Butler, who was greatly interested in the removal of the capital to Springfield, and who urged the young legislator to take up his residence at the new seat of government. Lincoln readily fell in with this suggestion, and accompanied his friend home when the legislature adjourned, sharing the lodging of Joshua F. Speed, a young Kentucky merchant, and taking his meals at the house of Mr. Butler for several years. In this way began Mr. Lincoln's residence in Springfield, where he was to remain until called to one of the highest of destinies entrusted to men, and where his ashes were to rest forever in monumental marble. It would have seemed a dreary village to one accustomed to the world, but in a letter written about this time, Lincoln speaks of it as a place where there was a good deal of flourishing about in carriages, a town of some pretentious to elegance. It had a population of 1,500. The county contained nearly 18,000 souls, of whom 78 were free Negroes, 20 registered indentured servants, and 6 slaves. Scarcely a perceptible trace of color, one would say, yet we find in the Springfield paper a leading article beginning with the startling announcement our state is threatened to be overrun with free Negroes. The county was one of the richest in Illinois, possessed of a soil of inexhaustible fertility, and divided to the best advantage between prairie and forest. It was settled early in the history of the state, and the country was held in high esteem by the aborigines. The name of Sangamon is said to mean, in the Potawatomi language, land of plenty. Its citizens were an excellent class of people, a large majority of them from Kentucky, the representatives were not wanting from eastern states, men of education and character. There had been very little of what might be called pioneer life in Springfield. Civilization came in with a reasonably full equipment at the beginning. The Edwardses, in fair top boots and ruffled shirts, the Ridgeleys brought their banking business from Maryland, the Logans and Conklings were good lawyers before they arrived. Another family came from Kentucky, with a cotton manufactory which proved its aristocratic character by never doing any work. With a population like this, the town had, from the beginning, a more settled and orderly type than was usual in the South and West. A glance at the advertising columns of newspaper will show how much attention to dress was paid in the new capital. Cloths, cassinets, casimirs, velvet, silk, satin, and Marseille vestings, fine calf boots, seal and morocco pumps for gentlemen. And for the sex, which in barbarism dresses less and in civilization dresses more than the male, silks, barrages, crepe lisse, lace veils, thread lace, Tibet shawls, lace handkerchiefs, fine prunella shoes, etc. It is evident that the young politician was confronting a social world more formidably correct than anything he had as yet seen. Governor Ford began some years before this to remark with pleasure the change in the dress of the people of Illinois. The gradual disappearance of leather and linsey woolsey, the hunting knife and tomahawk from the garb of men, the deerskin moccasins supplanted by the leather boot and shoe, the leather breeches tied around the ankle replaced by modern pantaloons, and the still greater improvement in the adornment of women, the former bare feet decently shod, and homespun frocks giving way to gowns of calico and silk and the heads tied up in red cotton turbans disappearing in favor of those surmounted by pretty bonnets of silk or straw. We admit that these changes were not unattended with the grumbling ill-will of the pioneer patriarchs. They predicted nothing but ruin to a country that thus forsook the old ways, which were good enough for their fathers. But with the change in dress came other alterations which were all for the better. A growing self-respect among the young, an industry and thrift by which they could buy good clothes, a habit of attending religious service where they could show them, a progress in sociability, civility, trade, and morals. The taste for civilization had sometimes a whimsical manifestation. Mr. Stewart said 
the members of the legislature bitterly complained of the amount of game, venison and grouse of the most delicious quality, which was served them at the taverns in Vandalia. They clamored for bacon. They were starving, they said, for something civilized. There was plenty of civilized nourishment in Springfield. Wheat was fifty cents a bushel, rye thirty-three, corn and oats were twenty-five, potatoes twenty-five, butter was eight cents a pound, and eggs were eight cents a dozen. Pork was two and a half cents a pound. The town was built on the edge of the woods, the north side touching the timber, the south encroaching on the prairie. The richness of the soil was seen in the mud of the streets, black as ink and of an unfathomable depth in time of thaw. There were, of course, no pavements or sidewalks. An attempt at crossings was made by laying down large chunks of wood. The houses were almost all wooden and were disposed in a rectangular blocks. A large square had been left in the middle of town in anticipation of future greatness, and there, when Lincoln began his residence, the work of clearing the ground for the new state house was already going forward. In one of the largest houses looking on the square at the northwest corner, the county court had its office, and other rooms in the building were let to lawyers. One of these was occupied by Stuart and Lincoln, for the friendship formed in the Black Hawk War and strengthened at Vandalia induced Major Stuart to offer a partnership to Captain Lincoln. Footnote. It is not unworthy of notice that in a country where military titles were conferred with ludicrous profusion and borne with absurd complacency, Abraham Lincoln, who had actually been commissioned and had served as captain, never used the designation after he laid down his command. Lincoln did not gain any immediate eminence at the bar. His preliminary studies had been cursory and slight, and Stuart was then too much engrossed in politics to pay the unremitting attention to the law which that jealous mistress requires. He had been a candidate for Congress the year before, and had been defeated by W. L. May. He was a candidate again in 1838, and was elected over so agile an adversary as Stephen Arnold Douglas. His paramount interest in these canvases necessarily prevented him from setting to his junior partner the example which Lincoln so greatly needed, of close and steady devotion to their profession. It was several years later that Lincoln found with Judge Logan the companionship and inspiration which he required, and began to be really a lawyer. During the first year or two, he is principally remembered in Springfield as an excellent talker. The life and soul of the little gatherings about the county offices, a storyteller of the first rank, a good-natured, friendly fellow whom everybody liked and trusted. He relied more upon his influence with a jury than upon his knowledge of law in the few cases he conducted in court his acquaintance with human nature being far more extensive than his legal lore. Lincoln was not yet done with Vandalia, its dinners of game, and its political intrigue. The archives of the state were not removed to Springfield until 1839, and Lincoln remained a member of the legislature by successive re-elections from 1834 to 1842. His campaigns were carried on almost entirely without expense, Joshua Speed told the writers that on one occasion some of the Whigs contributed a purse of $200, which Speed handed to Lincoln to pay his personal expenses in the canvas. After the election was over, the successful candidate handed Speed $199.25, with the request that he return it to the subscribers. I did not need the money, he said. I made the canvas on my own horse. My entertainment, being at the houses of friends, cost me nothing and my only outlay was seventy-five cents for a barrel of cider, which some farm hands insisted I should treat them to. He was called down to Vandalia in the summer of 1837 by a special session of the legislature. The magnificent schemes of the foregoing winter required some repairing. The banks throughout the United States had suspended specie payments in the spring, and as the state banks in Illinois were the fiscal agents of the railroads and canals, the governor called upon the lawmakers to revise their own work to legalize the suspension and bring their improvement system within possible bounds. They acted as might have been expected, complied with the former suggestion, but flatly refused to touch their masterpiece. They had been glorifying their work too energetically to destroy it in its infancy. It was said you could recognize a legislator that year in any crowd by his automatic repetition of the phrase, thirteen hundred fellow citizens and fifty miles of railroad. There was nothing to be done but to go on with the stupendous folly. Loans were effected with surprising and fatal facility, and before the end of the year, work had begun at many points on the railroad. 
The whole state was excited to the highest pitch of frenzy and expectation. Money was as plenty as dirt. Industry, instead of being stimulated, actually languished. We exported nothing, says Governor Ford, and everything from abroad was paid for by the borrowed money expended among us. Not only upon the railroads, but on the canal as well, the work was begun on a magnificent scale. Nine millions of dollars were thought to be a mere trifle in view of the colossal sum expected to be realized from the sale of canal lands, 300,000 acres of which had been given by the general government. There were rumors of coming trouble and of an unhealthy condition of the banks, but it was considered disloyal to look too curiously into such matters. One frank patriot, who had been sent as one of a committee to examine the bank at Shawneetown, when asked what he found there, replied with winning candor, plenty of good whiskey and sugar to sweeten it. But a year of baleful experience destroyed a great many illusions, and in the election of 1838 the subject of internal improvements was treated with much more reserve by candidates. The debt of the state, issued at a continually increasing discount, had already attained enormous proportions. The delirium of the last few years was ending, and sensible people began to be greatly disquieted. Nevertheless, Mr. Cyrus Edwards boldly made his canvass for governor as a supporter of the system of internal improvements, and his opponent, Thomas Carlin, was careful not to commit himself strongly on the other side. Carlin was elected, and finding that a majority of the legislature was still opposed to any steps backward, he made no demonstration against the system at the first session. Lincoln was a member of this body, and being by that time the unquestioned leader of the Whig minority, was nominated for speaker and came within one vote of an election. The legislature was still stiff-necked and perverse in regard to the system. It refused to modify it in the least, and voted, as if in bravado, another $800,000 to extend it. But this was the last paroxysm of a fever that was burnt out. The market was glutted with Illinois bonds. One banker and one broker after another, to whose hands they had been recklessly confided in New York and London, failed, or made away with the proceeds of sales. The system had utterly failed. There was nothing to do but repeal it, stop work on the visionary roads, and endeavor to invent some means of paying the enormous debt. This work taxed the energies of the legislature in 1839, and for some years after. It was a dismal and disheartening task. Blue Monday had come after these years of intoxication, and a crushing debt rested upon a people who had been deceiving themselves, with the fallacy that it would somehow pay itself by acts of the legislature. Many were the schemes devised for meeting these oppressive obligations without unduly taxing the voters. One of them, not especially wiser than the rest, was contributed by Mr. Lincoln. It provided for the issue of bonds for the payment of the interest due by the state, and for the appropriation of a special portion of state taxes to meet the obligations thus incurred. He supported his bill in a perfectly characteristic speech, making no effort to evade his share of the responsibility for the crisis, and submitting his views with diffidence to the approval of the assembly. His plan was not adopted. It was too simple and straightforward, even if it had any other merits, to meet the approval of an assembly intent only upon getting out of the immediate embarrassment by means which might save them future trouble on the stump. There was even an undercurrent of sentiment in favor of repudiation. But the payment of the interest for that year was provided for by an ingenious expedient which shifted upon the fund commissioners the responsibility of deciding what portion of the debt was legal and how much interest was therefore to be paid. Bonds were sold for this purpose at a heavy loss. This session of the legislature was enlivened by a singular contest between the Whigs and Democrats in relation to the state banks. Their suspension of specie payments had been legalized up to the adjournment of the next session of the legislature. They were not now able to resume, and it was held by the Democrats that if the special session adjourned sine die, the charter of the banks would be forfeited, a purpose the party was eager to accomplish. The Whigs, who were defending the banks, wished to prevent the adjournment of the special session until the regular session should begin, during the course of which they expected to renew the lease of life now held under sufferance by the banks, in which, it may be here said, they were finally successful. But on one occasion, being in the minority, and having exhausted every other parliamentary means of opposition and delay, and seeing the vote they dreaded imminent, they tried to defeat it by leaving the House in a body, 
and the doors being locked, a number of them, among whom Lincoln's tall figure was prominent, jumped from the windows of the church where the legislature was then holding its sessions. I think, says Mr. Joseph Gillespie, who was one of those who performed this feat of acrobatic politics, Mr. Lincoln always regretted it, as he deprecated everything that savored of the revolutionary. Two years later, the persecuted banks, harried by the demagogues and swindled by the state, fell with great ruin. The financial misery of the state was complete. Nothing was left of the brilliant schemes of the historic legislature of 1836 but a load of debt which crippled for many years the energy of the people, a few miles of embankments which the grass hastened to cover, and a few abutments which stood for years by the sides of leafy rivers waiting for their long-delaying bridges and trains. During the winter of 1840-41, occurred the first clash of opinion and principle between Mr. Lincoln and his lifelong adversary, Mr. Douglas. There are those who can see only envy and jealousy in that strong dislike and disapproval with which Mr. Lincoln always regarded his famous rival. But we think that few men have ever lived who were more free from those degrading passions than Abraham Lincoln, and the personal reprobation with which he always visited the public acts of Douglas arose from his sincere conviction that able as Douglas was, and in many respects admirable in character, he was essentially without fixed political morals. They had met for the first time in 1834 at Vandalia, where Douglas was busy in getting the circuit attorneyship away from John J. Hardin. He held it only long enough to secure a nomination to the legislature in 1836. He went there to endeavor to have the capital removed to Jacksonville, where he lived, but he gave up the fight for the purpose of having himself appointed Register of the Land Office at Springfield. He held this place as a means of being nominated for Congress the next year. He was nominated and defeated. In 1840, he was engaged in another scheme to which we will give a moment's attention, as it resulted in giving him a seat on the supreme bench of the state, which he used merely as a perch from which to get into Congress. There had been a difference of opinion in Illinois for some years as to whether the Constitution, which made voters of all white male inhabitants of six months' residence, meant to include aliens in that category. As the aliens were nearly all Democrats, that party insisted on their voting, and the Whigs objected. The best lawyers in the state were Whigs, and so it happened that most of the judges were of that complexion. A case was made up for the decision and decided adversely to the aliens, who appealed it to the Supreme Court. This case was to come on at the June term in 1840, and the Democratic Council, chief among whom was Mr. Douglas, were in some anxiety, as an unfavorable decision would lose them about 10,000 alien votes in the presidential election in November. In this conjuncture, one Judge Smith of the Supreme Court, an ardent Democrat, willing to enhance his value in the party, communicated to Mr. Douglas two important facts. First, that a majority of the court would certainly decide against the aliens, and secondly, that there was a slight imperfection in the record by which counsel might throw the case over to December term and save the alien vote for Van Buren and the Democratic ticket. This was done, and when legislature came together with its large Democratic majority, Mr. Douglas handed in a bill reforming the judiciary, for they had learned that serviceable word already. The circuit judges were turned out of office, and five new judges were added to the Supreme Court, who were to perform circuit duty also. It is needless to say that Judge Douglas was one of these, and he had contrived also in the course of the discussion to disgrace his friend Smith so thoroughly by quoting his treacherous communication of matters which took place within the court that Smith was no longer a possible rival for political honors. It was useless for the Whigs to try to prevent this degradation of the bench, there was no resource but a protest, and here again Lincoln uttered the voice of the conscience of the party. He was joined on this occasion by Edward D. Baker, footnote, afterwards senator from Oregon, and as colonel of the 71st Pennsylvania, called the 1st California, killed at Ball's Bluff, and some others who protested against the act because, first, it violates the principles of free government by subjecting the judiciary to the legislature, second, it is a fatal blow at the independence of the judges and the constitutional terms of their offices. Third, it is a measure not asked for or wished for by the people. 
Fourth, it will greatly increase the expense of our courts or else greatly diminish their utility. Fifth, it will give our courts a political and partisan character, thereby impairing public confidence in their decisions. Sixth, it will impair our standing with other states and the world. Seventh, it is a party measure for party purposes from which no practical good to the people can possibly arise, but which may be the source of immeasurable evils. The undersigned are well aware that this protest will be altogether unavailing with the majority of this body. The blow has already fallen, and we are compelled to stand by the mournful spectators of the ruin it will cause. It will be easy to ridicule this indignant protest as the angry outcry of beaten partisans, but fortunately we have evidence which cannot be gainsaid from the justice of its sentiments and the wisdom of its predictions. Governor Ford, himself a democratic leader, as able as he was honest, writing seven years after these proceedings, condemned them as wrong and impolitic, and adds, Ever since this reforming measure, the judiciary has been unpopular with democratic majorities. Many and most of the judges have had great personal popularity, so much so as to create complaint of so many of them being elected or appointed to other offices. But the bench itself has been the subject of bitter attacks by every legislature since. It had been soiled by unclean contact and could not be respected as before. End of section 9. Recording by Jesse Crisp Sears in Pittsburgh, North Carolina.